Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Friday. Uh, it's a momentous Friday. We just had an earthquake, which I don't recall us having had here for quite some time. Um, I, as you probably know, my name is Rita McGrath, and my guest today is Stephen Wunker who is the co-author, together with two other of my favorite people, of this brand new book, The Innovation Leader, uh, which is all about how you can um, create an organization that's able to innovate, as I like to say, as a proficiency, rather than having this kind of episodic, once in a while kind of thing happening. Um, so, Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. We, we shook the earth, Rita. There you go. There you are. <laughs> That's, great. That's right. The book made such an impact at the Earthship. Um, so maybe just for people that aren't familiar with you and your co-authors, maybe give us a little kind of overview of your backgrounds and where you came from. Sure, I, I'm happy to. So I started in uh, my career many years ago in the 1990s at Bain and Company as a typical strategy consultant. And I saw how what we did worked really well in industries where there was sort of a, a linear evolution, but where there were discontinuities, and there were certainly a lot of those in the late 90s, uh, we struggled. And so I immersed myself in, in those areas. I went into uh, tech and telecom. I helped develop one of the first smartphones, one of the first mobile marketing and commerce companies. Uh, I never thought I would be a consultant again. <laughs> um, but I moved back to Boston after one of the companies was sold, and um, I linked up with Clayton Christensen, who, of course, we have a, a common history with. And he was looking to build up his firm in a site based on sort of the best of uh, top tier strategy consulting, but applied to situations of disruption and discontinuity. So I was one of a small group of people who joined together to see how we could adapt the strategy consulting toolkit for that and did that for six years and that's how we, we first met uh and then i spun out new markets advisors uh in 2009 to do similar sort of work albeit with a different business model mm -hmm. for and we're we're 15 people based in boston also in offices in san juan puerto rico where i'm lucky enough to be right now uh and in lisbon portugal as well now uh my co-authors, one of them was a longtime uh, principal at New Markets, Jennifer Luo Law, and she helped uh, write my last book, uh, Cost Evasion, together with me. Uh, she is now at Phillips. Uh, she's the leader of the maternal and fetal health business there. So uh, she is loving that. And then another is a person who you've also known from uh, the, the past life, Hari Nair. Hari used to lead Innocite Ventures, so the venture capital business within the Innocite Clay Christensen's family. Uh, he is currently at Procter & Gamble as VP of R&D. Uh, Hari, Jennifer, and I actually started this collaboration back in 2018. So it uh, took five years of research and writing to get to fruition. Uh, so we've changed hats a few times, except for me. I'm going to be here till, uh, you know, till I'm not with the world anymore, probably. Um, but uh, that's how the, the genesis of the, book, of the book came about. And what was the spark that said, hey, you know, the world needs this book? You know, so much of writing about innovation, including uh, my past books, was about the what of innovation. Uh, how do you create a great idea using jobs to be done? What's your strategy of new markets? How do you apply the tools of innovation to the cost side of business? Which are uh, important topics, but over and over and over again, we see that innovation actually struggles, not because of the what, but because of the how. There are so many great ideas out there that don't get traction. And that doesn't matter whether it's a big organization or a small organization. A lot of those challenges are actually ones that organizations have in common. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to find out about how do people actually make it happen. So this the book is a combination of the accumulated wisdom that we've had over our careers, but then... We went out and we talked with 50 great innovative leaders in all walks of life to try to understand what was the toolkit they had in common that we could recommend to others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things that's striking about the book is so you've got the sort of 
first part, which is your your ABC framework, which we'll which we'll get to in just a sec. Um, and then in the middle, you've got like very very prescriptive um, suggestions for you know what kind of innovation should um, a company pursue. You know, are you visionaries like? Apple, you know, are you are you more bottom up? Um, and then the end of the book, you got a whole bunch of diagnostics, which I thought was interesting because most people don't put that in a book. You know, they stick it on their website or something, and maybe somebody does it, and maybe they don't. And I thought the questions were very thought provoking. So maybe maybe go through the ABC framework just so people can understand kind of how you're putting together the the, the basic framework for the, the thought process. We wanted to give a overarching structure to this book, which is very straightforward. And then there, there's layers of nuance and complexity under that structure. But at the highest level, we found that companies need to deploy ABC to make innovation sustainably successful. And ABC corresponds to aspire, build, cultivate. They need to have a very clear innovation aspiration. We actually did a survey uh, recently on uh, on LinkedIn of corporate innovators. We got a good number replying to ask, what is the biggest obstacle to innovation in your organization? Is it uh, not having uh, a clear direction for innovation? Is it having too few ideas? Is it poor execution of good ideas? Or is it a uh, lack of an innovative culture? 52% of the responses were not having a clear direction for innovation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I knew that would be high. I didn't think it would be as high as that. Mm -hmm. So aspire, have a very clear aspiration that folks can understand. Be built. What are the mechanisms by which you get in different trends, partnerships, ideas? How do you cultivate those? If people have a good idea, what happens to it? How do you uh, iterate and execute? How do you do discovery different planning? Uh, how, do, how do you kill the projects that aren't panning out? Because organizations, no matter what the size, they usually stink at doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, how do you go scale up and double down, be decisive on what works? So B, build. And C, finally, cultivate. How do you cultivate the behaviors, the culture that ensure that it's not just you as a leader, whether you're CEO or a VP or just to have a small team or maybe even yourself, how do you cultivate a culture that ensures that all the daily decisions that your colleagues make are guided by a shared set of values, a shared sort of compass heading, uh, so you don't have to be too prescriptive, which ultimately is not never going to scale to really successful, innovative organizations. So one of the um, sort of challenges I see companies struggle with is, is, as you said, the lack of clarity around what is this innovation stuff supposed to do for us in the beginning. But, um, and, and this is something that uh, Bob Bergelman's written a lot about, which is this episodicness of innovation. And I know in the book, you stress the importance of sustained resource commitments to innovation, but wh why do you think it is that it, in so many cases, it kind of comes and then it maybe enjoys its day in the sun and then a leader moves on. I mean, I'll give you an example. When I was doing um, a lot of work at IBM, this would have been back in the 90s, uh, and Lou Gerstner was the CEO at the time and built what I still consider to be you know, a textbook example of a terrific innovation program. It was called the Emerging Business Opportunity Program. And you know, it, it, it was almost as though they read your book, right? <laughs> For those of us just joining, uh, we're talking about the book, The Innovation Leader uh, by Steve Wonker and colleagues. And Steve is with me here. Um, and then when Gerstner moved on, Pomisano came in and Pomisano was very much a, you know, shareholder returns, market driven by the numbers kind of person. And the whole thing just really withered um, and you know, had to be reinvented over and over again. So why do you think that happens? No innovation program is perfect, right? Even, even at EBO, I remember they had, uh, they had one fatal flaw, which is that they got these super high-flying execs to come in and do a quick rotation to lead an emerging business opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem with those high-flying execs is they knew that in 18 months, they'd be on to something else. Uh, and so it, things were built for a lot of flash and bang, but not necessarily for sustainable success. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, you you learn these things, but people can lose patience. Or I mean, I've seen very successful innovation programs happening, like in a consumer goods uh, company I worked with, and then there was a huge product recall. 
Uh, and uh, you know, wiped out a quarter of revenues in one year. Yeah. And so it was easy to cut something that was ultimately a discretionary expense. Mm -hmm. So people get frustrated and they guardrail, right? They, they over-resource and they do a lot of innovation theater and uh, things that feel good, but don't have the long-term vision to actually deliver the big returns. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they cut. But innovation is like a brand, right? You don't build a brand through very episodic. Now we're going to say a lot about this brand and then we'll go dark for five years and then we'll say a lot more about it. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, it has to be sustainably nurtured, which means just being realistic at the outset about what you can afford, having a portfolio plan of how much is going to be invested early on for quick wins, low risk, how much later, bigger returns, diversifying your risk types, all the sorts of things. But we talk about the book, and I know you talk about it as well, but are often steps that people skip just in a little bit of haste. It really has a big negative long-term impact. Absolutely. Well, and so one of the other things that I, I found very amusing reading the book was um, the sort of typical myths about innovation, like like what what do people commonly get wrong? That, that people that really know innovation and understand it wouldn't wouldn't believe those things. So, the, I, I, of course, I, I do a keynote speech on this. The big message of the keynote, uh, because you have to choose, right? The big message of the keynote is that innovation is not like it's taught in the movies. It is <laughs> about the great idea that you get uh, in the shower and it transforms the world. Uh, it undergoes a lot of evolution. It is a team sport. Uh, and you know, often, as uh, Stephen Johnson says, it's about the slow build of the idea, right? Uh, so, like evolution was out there as a... Uh, very nascent idea. It took Darwin 20 years to actually come out with a fully articulated theory of evolution. So hopefully we're not talking about 20 years, but this also did not hit, uh, hit Darwin as he was driving to work, you know? <laughs> so I'd say that is the biggest and most harmful uh, myth. And the solve for that is having systems. People think that systems are antithetical to innovation, but actually... Uh, they go hand in hand, especially in a large organization. Innovation thrives in unpredictability, right? That that gives innovation uh, fertile ground to implant. But you don't meet, meet uh, unpredictability with unpredictability. You meet it with a consistent way to deal with the unpredictability. U.S. military figured that out many, many years ago, right? They, the Marines are outstanding at dealing with unpredictable situations, but they have systematic ways to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, one of my guests some time back was a former Navy SEAL, mm -hmm. and he made the observation that I thought was very interesting. He said, as an individual, you might be incredibly talented, but what we're looking for is the person who can work with other individuals to bring out the best in them and to participate as a team. And I thought that was a very insightful uh, observation. Yeah, so one of my favorite myths of innovation is it's all about the idea. <laughs> By the time we're done with this webcast, you know, there'll be 50 more ideas than anybody could possibly execute in the course of a year. So, um, you know, it's what comes after the idea. And, uh, and I know you talk about this in the, um, uh, in the sort of sections on processes, um, but this notion of really building capability at innovation. So this is another thing that I have always found to be completely baffling. So if you were a CEO and you wanted to, I don't know, go to a foreign country, right? You would not take somebody with absolutely zero supply chain experience and put them in charge of that program, <laughs> you know, without any training or warning. I mean, you'd be putting yourself at enormous risk. And yet with innovation, I see it all the time. People who've never been trained, never had any experience, never actually done anything like that. They get put in charge of these things. Um, and then everybody wonders why they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you know? It's interesting. Uh, no, 100%. Um, you get either people who are uh, have done very well in the corporate world and move over, or you, conversely, you get people who are coming from the entrepreneurial world and don't know how to navigate in a corporate environment, yeah. which also doesn't work terribly well. So, you know, to the point of, of the Navy SEALs and other high-performing teams, it's the members of the team, uh, right? A, a, a good athletic team 
doesn't have just you know, a basketball team doesn't have just people who can shoot well from the three point line, right? <laughs> you have a, a mix of skills uh, and that makes it effective. Uh, it is like many things with innovation. It requires a little more work at the outset, uh, but then over time that generates a lot of returns. Uh, it also means that you often have to phase the instigation of these things, or you uh, you hybrid it where there's some outsiders who provide skills temporarily, and then you you insource it more. But um, people don't want to do that, uh, and they often think that they have this repository of ideas. By the way, in the survey, only six percent of people said that having too few ideas was the biggest problem in their organization. So I, I totally believe that. Totally agree. Uh, but they think, yeah, okay, we'll go from these ideas through to finished product, and it doesn't work that way. So I'd love you to spend some time explaining to our listeners um, that the incubation process, like, like, where do you put it? Who's responsible for it? How do you measure it? Because if you think about, you know, you've got ideation on the one hand, right? And then on the other hand, when you do get something that works, you've got acceleration where you've now got a mature the thing and bring it up to the status where it can meet the, you know, meet the needs of being a part of the core business. And it's sort of a card carrying member of the corporate public public, but that, that piece in the middle seems to be where things just fall apart. Um, and, and, and I, I think companies just don't understand how to bring that into maturity. So I think the first thing a company needs to do, again, whatever your, your size, and it doesn't even have to be a, a corporation. We talked with uh, Clark Gilbert, who you know, in the uh, uh, LDS church, he, a magnificent innovator, mm -hmm. uh, a religious institution. Uh, we talked with the head of school, many others. You have to understand what is your innovation model. Uh, we, we refer to innovation archetypes. Mm -hmm. So there is the top-down visionary organization like an apple. There is the bottom up, have a thousand flowers bloom like Google. Folks say they want to be like Google and Apple and that doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> it, it, it's, you, you want to be effective like them, but the way you get there is utterly different. You can be uh, outside in like uh, Meta is for instance, large and uh, you can be very- they buy, they buy their innovations. Uh, yes, or they do uh, venture investments. Uh, yes, or they do aqua hires. Yes, that's right. Uh, you can be very systematic, like, well, my co-authors at, at P&G and Phillips. Uh, or you can very consciously try to be a, a cellular sort of structure. Uh, like what we talked about, uh, Wasabi, arguably Amazon is like that too. It's a fairly uh, cellular way of, of coming up with, with innovation. So know what your model is, and then that sort of dictates how do you start incubating. Uh, if you're top down, you don't need a whole lot of projects. You need to resource them very well and accept that they will evolve, but uh from the outset, you better be pretty good and don't go too slow because the the top brass really wants progress on their on their projects. Uh, bottom up is very different. There you can resource people to have sort of their own uh, incubation. Now, you might call it a fifteen percent or twenty percent uh, time, like a three M or Google, where people might spend extra time. I mean, look in Silicon Valley, that extra time is often otherwise known as Saturday morning. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let's take that with a grain of salt, but there, there is some bandwidth for people to vote with their feet and join projects that they think have uh, opportunity. Uh, in the outside in model, it's more about uh, doing sort of venture investments or uh, other sorts of support, which might not even involve equity, uh, but other sorts of uh, collaborations that can evolve very early stage products to something that is fit enough for a, a significant uh, either equity investment or an outright acquisition. Uh, and then the cellular structure has its own sort of decentralized mechanisms for innovation. Um, uh, Microsoft is another example where uh, largely that's done, albeit there's also some coordinated centralized innovation resources too for more of the sort of the fundamental computer science. Mm -hmm. If you're in that systematic innovation bucket, which I suspect many of, of your, your viewers are, 
Uh, and this is the long answer, Rita. So no, <laughs> I, and, and, and I think it's really super interesting. Right. So if, if you're in that bucket, uh, again, it's ABC. Have that aspiration set clearly. I can't tell you how many incubators we've worked with that don't have clear uh, goalposts. And so they they serve up an offering to the gods on Mount Olympus and they hope the gods will be happy that day. And sometimes they're not and they don't know why. And so something comes down again and then they, they try to guess what will please the gods tomorrow. Uh, the clear aspirations just save so much heartache. Um, have the structures built so that it's not only clear how ideas come into the process and what happens to them, but what the transition is after the fact. We do a very detailed study of Princess Cruises uh, and how they, they did that. We can go into that maybe a little later. And then sometimes these incubators have uh, broader responsibilities as well for building capabilities more generally in the organization uh, and even helping to change the culture. Uh, but have a very clear view about what you're from to is there. Uh, what problem specifically are you trying to solve for? Culture is a lagging variable, not a leading variable. So you can't start with changing the culture. Uh, but if there are particular issues, then you can change performance metrics or uh, stage gate review practices, uh, the sorts of things that are the harder levers that can affect the softer variables like culture. And do you have recommendations about where in the organization it sits or does that more a function of which, which innovation archetype you're using? Uh, I think it's both a function of the innovation archetype. So you could be more, um, if you're outside in, for instance, that in incubation or uh, early idea evolution might sit like at J&J, uh, &J, Johnson Johnson used to have the development corporation, for instance. Uh, and JJDC, uh, JJ Development Corporation, would help to incubate some of these outside-in opportunities. And that's gone through a couple iterations, but they still have structures to, to do that. Um, otherwise, it could be in R&D, it could be in marketing. It partly depends on, on the industry and also what you're solving for. Uh, if you're incubating new approaches in um, pharma clinical development, for instance, uh, then that uh, that unit needs to sit in the clinical development organization. Uh, and it probably needs to report at a fairly high level within clinical development. Uh, whereas if it's new products in a consumer goods uh, environment, usually that would be in marketing. Interesting. Very interesting. That's fun. Um, so let's talk a little bit about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, failure. <laughs> because one of the things we know about anything highly uncertain, and I would put innovation in that bucket, um, you know, more is going to go wrong than goes right. Um, and, and how do you manage the human dynamics of that? And you have some suggestions in the book, which I thought were interesting. Absolutely. So um, failure can occur at many stages. Right. Failure can occur at the very outset when somebody uh, proposes a wacky idea to you and you've got a thousand fires burning and you're like, OK, whatever, Bob, we're not going to go there. Um, th that's not good. Right. I mean, you don't have to go there, but you can understand what was Bob thinking? Uh, what need was he solving for? Where did this idea come from? Were there other ideas he thought about, too, and discarded when he brought this particular idea? Uh, so that's a very early stage failure that could be managed better. Uh, failure can occur in the middle of the funnel where you actually are failing but haven't fully told everybody yet. So you have the, the zombie projects that are slowly marching forward, uh, not alive, not dead, sort of in the middle uh, and sucking up a whole lot of energy. Uh, and you know, venture capitalists are ruthless about uh, declaring dead or alive. And you need some of that. And then failure at the end of the funnel uh, can happen as well. Uh, and there you need to be apolitical and be careful about the cultural messages you're, you're sending. Um, Jeff Bezos, when Amazon launched the Fire Phone. Uh, so the Fire Phone was the Amazon's one attempt at building a cell phone. And it was, it was aptly named because it was a flaming disaster. I mean, what? A, a, they sold 35,000 units, which is just a pittance in the world of cell phones. Uh, the Fire Phone was distinguished by its capability of being, you could point it at something 
And uh, then the phone would tell you where you could buy that on Amazon. Uh, and afterwards, Bezos had a, a postmortem. And he said, look, I should be the number one person saying we need to be customer obsessed. But I was intoxicated by this concept, which was really great for Amazon, but mm -hmm. not great for the customer. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, blame this on. But even more importantly, he then assigned that product team, went on to their next product, which ended up being the Amazon Echo and Alexa. And that really resonated in, in the lunchroom, which is the, the most important room in a company. It's the lunchroom because that's where culture gets formed. Uh, uh, it resonated that you can fail. And if you fail for decent reasons, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, so lots of ways to deal with failure, um, but all of them are uh, objective and open-minded and as apolitical and apersonal as possible. Now, sometimes you get stupid failure and people need to get fired for that or severely reprimanded, um, but there's plenty of that already. People, <laughs> Companies don't need to be told to do that. Yeah. It's other behaviors that need to be cultivated. Well, my friend uh, Amy Edmondson uh, wrote a book recently called Right Kind of Wrong, and she defines failure as three types, right? So you've got um, what she calls the basic failures, and those are the stupid ones, like, you know, you didn't follow the procedure, you forgot to bolt the door down, you, you know, ignored the handbook, um, and those rightly should be stamped out and people should be made aware that there will be consequences, <laughs> Um, and then you've got what she calls the complex systems failures. And these are things like, uh, you know, air traffic control, where every single participant just needs to be hyper vigilant because, you know, these large scale systems catastrophes typically aren't like one thing breaking down. It's a whole concatenation of multiple things going wrong that build up. Uh, and then you've got a concept that I really love, which I think the term was coined by Sim Sitkin at Duke, but it's called intelligent failures. And an intelligent failure to me is um, that's where the gold is, because the only way you can learn under highly uncertain conditions is by trying. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, some some of your tries are going to prove fruitful and some of them are not. Um, I was had a great conversation with Ed Catmull, the um, for a long time CEO of Pixar, uh, and they were on a he and his team were they came from the world of computer science and they were on a 25 year journey to make the movie, which ended up being Toy, Toy Story, which came out in 1995. But they started this thinking it was a 10 year project. It turned out to be a 25 year project. And he said, you know, we we never thought of it as failing. And in, and in fact, he would say um, this is something people misunderstand about his work and his writing. He said, we never even thought about it as failing. We thought about it as we tried something and it didn't work. So we moved on to trying the next thing. And I think that kind of experimental mindset is one that a lot of corporate people seem very uncomfortable with. You know, they they want to know, you know, I want to be able to predict what's going to happen. Well, if you could predict what's going to happen, it's not very innovative, right? Right. Um, yeah, I, I've certainly, well, I've been responsible for some stupid failures, but also some intelligent failures uh, in my career. So I, uh, I really relate to that. We have um, sometimes done postmortems at companies that are trying to revamp their um, innovation process. And here I'm talking about my consulting firm, New Markets Advisors, um, trying to understand why some projects went wrong. Mm -hmm. And very often, it's because the, whether it's a stage gate review or some sort of executive discussions of projects got dysfunctional mm -hmm. and they end up being sales conversations with its you know, project team selling the execs rather than in a real discussion about risk and the uncertainties, which is where you really want executive feedback. You don't you can sell them through a pre-read or whatever, tell them, or inform them, I should say, not just sell them, uh, but then have a very objective and, and detailed conversation about risk, which by the way, does not happen in 20 minutes squeezed in with five other projects that they're reviewing in that hour long meeting. Uh, it takes a little bit of time, uh, but it will save you a whole lot of time and money down the road. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. I um, 
I ran across the work of Bent Fluberg. I don't know if you know him. He's um, he's at Oxford and one of the Danish universities. And he uh, is, he's a geographer and he studies mega projects. I think he's one of the few people in the world who's really made that his specialization. Um, and I ran across this piece he wrote in Harvard Business Review and I was thinking, oh wow, he's detected all these problems with big mega projects that are identical to all the problems with big failed innovation you know, programs. And um, as you know, I've, I've studied flops myself and, and I got started studying the big ones. You know, Disney goes to Europe and has a disaster. And, you know, who knows how to run a theme park better than Disney? Why did that happen? Or um, FedEx invents zap mail just on the cusp of fax machines being readily available. And then bring that up to today. And we've got, you know, Google's Stadia gaming platform. They we were in it, in it, in it until all of a sudden, well, maybe not. Um, <laughs> and Iser Bush and Kerrig's drink works, you know, the, the make a cocktail with the push of a button, uh, Zillow's home buying. So these things keep happening. And I think, um, I think when you look at them, at least the pattern I talked about is, you know, untested assumptions taken as facts, this lack of opportunity to do low commitment testing, too much money, ironically, too much money, too many people chasing the big thing that's got to work. And it's the boss's pet project. And nobody's allowed to say maybe it's an ugly baby. You know? <laughs> and so I think, I think we have to go into it eyes wide open. Absolutely. One of the greatest capability gaps we find is also inventory capability gaps. And there's some, uh, some of that in the book, actually, in those surveys that you mentioned. By the way, they are online. Oh, they are. Our site, innovativeleaderbook.com, innovativeleaderbook.com. Okay. Uh, yeah, so there's a there's a whole chapter. I mean, I don't know what a chapter or a list, but was, there's an audit of your organization. Yes, Innovative that's right. Book. And yeah, the reason about doing it online is you can benchmark yourself against uh, other respondents and you can even have your team do it and see how your team responds is very. Um, I'm sorry, I totally forgot the point, but it was about experimentation. Oh, yes. The point is that people often rate uh, both themselves and their organizations at being very bad at experimentation. Uh, and I am preaching to the choir with you. I know. Mm -hmm. But... The, that discipline of, of disciplined experimentation does not exist outside of R&D in so many organizations. Uh, and it's remarkable how companies could be outstanding at it in their science labs. And it does not translate through to the customer experience, the sales process, the uh, other sorts of internal processes in the company, the supplier engagement. There's none of that that occurs. Mm -hmm. So the... Um, the skill of building that will help not only those individual innovation projects, but actually echoes in the core business as well. Well, I think one of the things I would observe is, you know, when I first started in in the work on innovation that I was doing, and they typically stuck us innovation entrepreneurship people somewhere in a strategy group. That was sort of the most the most prevalent place you'd find us. And all the cool kids at the time were doing, you know, industry analysis and order of entry and R and D intensity, and they were using the profit impact of market strategies database, which came out of GE. Um, and that was what the cool kids were doing. They were all sort of focused on the industry because I think the understanding was that you know, industries were relatively distinct and relatively slow to change. And your competitive potential was all about where you were in your industry. And those of us studying innovation, we were kind of in the corner huddled together for warmth, you know. And what I think has happened now is that we're starting to see um, the two fields really coming together. Um, so increasingly, we're seeing companies being really pushed for, okay, what, what's your growth plan? What are your ideas? Where are you, you know, where are you finding your future? Don't tell me what you did yesterday. I'm not really interested. Uh, and going forward. And so, um, it, you know, it, it is interesting to me that external forces have vastly increased the amount of uncertainty that we're finding, even in the core business, you know, even in businesses you thought were completely and totally predictable and were going to be the same 10 years from now as they are today. Vast change. And one of the observations I would make is that Part of what is causing this is we're seeing the introduction of what um, you know some people have called exponential uh, change in in these learning systems, and I think AI really sort of digs into this, which is you know it, it, linear change is easy, right? So we have a journey of a hundred days, 
And by the time 30 days have gone by, we think yeah, we should be roughly a third of the way there. Exponential change is completely different. And exponential change is some kind of compounding function, right? So like two plus two and then four plus four and then eight plus eight. And, then, and, um, and, and human brains find it very difficult to get um, our heads around that. So one of the things I've... Um, I'm intrigued by, right, is we're kind of used to exponential functions in software, like in, in digital kind of products. But what I think we're seeing now is these exponential functions finding their way into physical products. Um, and an example I would look at is this whole introduction of vertical farming, where you're, you know, right now, a lot of our food is a very linear process. It gets grown on a farm, it gets picked, it gets stored, it gets put on a truck, it gets shipped. And, you know, you could you could use far more energy moving the food around than you actually benefit from eating it, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and so these vertical farms, the premise is kind of interesting, which is if we can grow food close to where it's going to be consumed, then it, it, we waste a lot less energy in transit. It contributes to the circular economy, la, 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 la. But by definition, these vertical farms are also... In intensely digital you know they're they're they've got to be protected from bugs they're in these enclosed environments everything's sort of censored and computer controlled so you got one of the most basic products if you will that humanity's ever invented food you can eat and grow you know like combined now with this sort of in, in, innovative um exponential sort of thing so to come back to the point uh I think the skills of innovation in terms of experimentation learning from experience figuring out what intelligent failures have to teach you are just as relevant to the core business today as they are to the innovative businesses. And so one of the enduring mysteries to me is why the core business people aren't more enthusiastic about embracing those tools. Uh, 100%. Um, the worst strategic mistakes I've seen people make are often not the obvious ones, but where they... Uh, ignore the asymmetric threat, which may be disruptive. It might be, according to the classic uh, definition, disruptive innovation it might be something different. Um, but it has involved uh, ignoring exponential change. Now, conversely, you do see organizations uh, able to embrace that and thrive. And sometimes they're in tech. So Amazon, Microsoft have certainly done that very effectively. But uh, if you want to go to food and ag, uh, I think Cargill has been pretty good about uh, capturing some of the upside. We profile Olam uh, in the book, which is a competitor to Cargill. Uh, and they have grown humongously over a couple of decades as an agricultural trading organization by uh, embracing, leaning into that exponential change. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't have to be all glitzy high tech to have um, that apply to it. No, we totally agree. You know, uh, Rita, you mentioned, so you mentioned what, what's happening with AI. Um, and what, what I'm seeing is what we do a, a decent amount in AI and have for, for quite some time. It is so reminiscent of what I saw back in the 90s with the advent of the internet and consulting, <laughs> which was, I see, I, I joined Bain in 1996. And then it was, oh, we should put a lot of our um, brochures online. And so that was happening. And in 1997, uh, it's okay, we should make these websites transactional. And then what happened in 1998 was, oh my Lord, the sky is falling. We need to do something massive right now. And this is not healthy. Uh, and it is happening all over again where uh, people are, are, they're doing their chat bots and you know, that's wonderful to do the chat bots. Uh, but there is so much more that can be done with AI. What it requires, though, is a different way of thinking about not just your new businesses, but your core organization and the workflows in your organization, your work practices. Uh, and that is getting ignored until people won't have the luxury of ignoring it. Uh, and then, you know, you fear the humongous efforts to try to right the ship as some sorts of uh, asymmetric competitors come in or industry economics change. Uh, and that is gonna be very disturbing. You know, innovation is a little bit like watching a horror movie. If you're a uh, experienced horror movie uh, viewer, which thankfully I'm not, but you know, you're, you're saying, don't go up the stairs, don't go up the stairs. And the character goes up the stairs. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and there are reasons why corporations behave this way, um, but, you know what's going to happen. 
Well, so let's pick up on that because, um, I mean, the data are very clear. If you look at the average lifespan of, a, of even a very large company in the Fortune 500, there was some research that was done, I want to say Deloitte did this, and did a big study of, of sort of publicly traded firms over a long time span. And what they found out was there are outliers, but the average lifespan of a company is somewhere between 50 and 60 years. Um, so what that means is, you know, you have these humongous companies that, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees in some cases, and they're not going to survive longer than middle age in human age terms, right? And so we know the data are there that if you don't invest in innovation, if you don't invest in your future, that eventually you're going to become irrelevant and slink off into obsolescence and probably disband or get acquired or, you know, something. So we know that. I mean, it's not like this is a great, great big mystery. I mean, um, McKinsey was writing about this, I think, back in the 90s, right? The the innovation, the attack, innovation, the attacker's advantage. The attacker's advantage, Dick yeah. Foster. Yeah. yeah, right, right, Dick Foster. Um, so, so we all know this. So why is it so hard in many companies to make the case that this needs attention. It needs time. You know, in the book, by the way, if those of you just joining us, the book is the Innovative Leader. Um, you know, what what that it, to get it right, and and what it makes me think of this is, on the one hand, just about anything labeled AI right now, CEOs are going, oh, okay, well, who do I make the checkout to, right? So there's this like overdoing it on the one hand without actually knowing what you're doing, and then on the other hand, there's this resistance to say you know, I'm going to, I'm going to dedicate a team of people to exploring this thing. I had an experience recently with a big multinational um, and they had this huge program, which was going to be pan Asia. And it was going to transform the way healthcare was monitored and the payment schemes were done. La, 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 la. And I asked the, I asked the question, well, okay, who's, who's, who's the full-time team working on this project? And the answer was nobody. <laughs> you know, it was like two part-timers and half an intern. And I'm like, well, if you were serious about it, it would be somebody's job. Um, so how do you kind of come to grips with that paradox? Because I'm sure you must run into it with your clients all the time. Uh, I do. Um, let's take Satya Nadella as an example. Yeah. So it's kind enough to contribute a few quotes for the book. And you, you open up with the story of Microsoft, which yeah, is... It's a great story. Great story. It really is a good story. So, uh, I, and uh, look, I, I, I never like to attribute so much success to one person, but here it's pretty clear, right? The uh, In the 14 years that Ballmer was CEO of Microsoft, the stock declined by 33%. Uh, from the day that Satya took over to now, the stock has appreciated 1,100%. That's it's quite a difference. <laughs> so what did he do? So one of the first things he did was establish a mechanism for visibility about what was actually going on in the organization for innovation not to micromanage it and second guess it and get all of these approvals, but even to know. And he found that there was one big emerging technology which had a total of four people working on it across Microsoft. Hmm. Uh, and then there were others that had a tremendous number of people. So that's not good. So he was able to figure that out and also then create some cross fertilization among business units. Uh, and then he created some very clear strategic direction, the aspiration. Initially, it was all about the cloud. Whatever you do, it's got to be build a leading cloud business for Microsoft. Uh, and by golly, that worked. Even though people said at the time Amazon was way ahead, it worked. Uh, and then he switched to say, okay, yes, cloud, but AI. And that's working. So... Knowing the visibility and having some st clear strategic direction is important. And then being able to resource things appropriately because you have that strategic direction is important as well. That doesn't mean micromanaging what is the future of AI at Microsoft because nobody knows. They've got a lot of brilliant people, but nobody knows. Um, but you can place several intelligent bets and establish strategic positions. And from that, then you expand. So, I mean, look, you you wrote the book, The End of Competitive Advantage, right? But that doesn't mean that you never have a competitive advantage. It just means that you can't just say that's your advantage forever. We, my point was it's transient. You know, you have it for a while. And my, my favorite poster child of this was, um, you may remember back in the 2010s, 2011s, there was this enormous 
frou-frou about, about direct-to-consumer companies, you know, it's like um, Dollar Shave Club and Harry's and Glossier, and, you know, and the world was going to be taken by storm by these scrappy little companies that were skipping retail and building direct relationships with their customers. And, you know, did, what is it, maybe a year ago, I started seeing headlines going, the direct-to-consumer phase has, you know, transpi transpired. And my point was not that it was a bad idea. My point was that it, it, had, it was a great idea in the right boundary conditions. And those boundary conditions have now changed. You know, customer acquisition's gotten a lot more expensive. The incumbents have figured this out too, and they're now doing their own direct to consumer plays and, 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 and. So you have it for a while and enjoy it for a while, but you know, you have to come up with the next thing, which is what the innovation process is really about. Uh, 100%. And uh, you need to find out what that advantage gets you. What it, It's like a chess game, right? You've made the move. Now, what other new moves are open up to you because of that? Mm -hmm. uh, but people want to plan it out many moves in advance. And, uh, oh, it's it's fun to do that. But you're, you're kidding yourself. In an exponential change world, world, you are kidding yourself. Oh, yeah. So th this was, the, you know, the, the the brilliance of what Satya did at, at Microsoft, right? He He knew what those next moves were, but then he stayed open to what the ones could be after that. Uh, but he also didn't analyze it forever. He, he's been incredibly decisive, uh, whether it's, uh, I mean, just look in the past year about trying to hire Sam Altman and his team or uh, succeeding in hiring the most of the team uh, behind perplexity or the, the Pi uh, intelligent agent with AI. Uh, so when the uh, there is enough certainty, they move ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's I alluded to the U.S. Marines before. They have a, a doctrine: if you're eighty percent certain, that's good enough. Go. Yeah. Well, so there was a very interesting um, uh, diagnosis of of Apple in the um, autonomous vehicle business that just came out in Bloomberg. I want to say a week or two ago, because just recently Apple announced that they're no longer going forward with that project, and the article goes over like five years of. Well, we started with this and then the leader changed and then we changed it to that and then the leader changed and then we did this other thing and then the leader changed. I mean, to the tune of like billions of dollars into this project. And one of the big things that they concluded was that there was a lack of decisiveness at the top of the house. Now, why I think that's interesting and why I raise it now is, you know, one of your innovation archetypes and Apple's known for this, right, is the visionaries lead. Well, you know, you've got this very interesting to me sort of pattern that I see, which is you don't have room for that many visionaries in a typical company, right? You, you know, like one, <laughs> it's kind of what you've got. And for that visionary to be effective, they've usually got to be supported by people that are operators. And we saw this, we saw this at P&G, right? When A.G. Laffley left and he got replaced by a former military guy who was really an operational guy. Um, we saw it, of course, with Tim Cook at Apple. Um, and so they're different types of people <laughs> you know so i i wonder sometimes if um for example and my, microsoft another great example so you had gates who i would argue was the visionary and then bomber who was like the sales guy i love this company you know um really making things happen on the ground um and then he gets booted out and he gets replaced by Nadella. Um, and so I, I wonder sometimes if the fact that we have these different types of leaders in succession um, create some of these roadblocks for innovation because if the Apple car is any example, they just couldn't pick a pick a pick a swim lane and go with it, right? Um, and you know, in a way, it's really sad because I think what Nadella would tell you is, let's take the example of Tay. Do you remember Tay? Um, that little little chat yeah, that they released very it. Very misbegotten, disastrous chatbot. <laughs> but um, but Nadella literally wrote to the head of that team. Um, you know, I think you're right. I think we need to be experimenting with AI. We need to see how computers and humans interact. Like we think I think that's really important. This particular one didn't didn't work out the way we were hoping. But I really thought you were brave at making that move. So you know the thing didn't work out, but it wasn't, the person didn't work out and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't second guessing their decision. You know, it's just, I think, I think they just vastly underestimated the awfulness of human beings on Twitter. <laughs> but, but I think his perspective was, you know, directionally, this was an appropriate experiment to run. It didn't happen to work out, but you know, nobody died. I mean, it was embarrassing, but that's all it was. Um, the other thing I would mention about Nadella that I think is powerful is his focus on leading indicators. You know, so he says, and I, I'll never forget, shortly after he um, 
became CEO, I was invited to be a keynote at one of his big management meetings, you know, so I fly to um, Seattle, get to the Bellevue Hotel, throw open the doors to the ballroom and at the back of the room, like in letters as tall as I am, is the word empathy. And I'm like, oh no, you know, I'm in the wrong meeting. Like this is a Microsoft meeting. What? <laughs> right? Because historically that has not been the firm's sweet spot. But his point was, you don't get usage unless customers really like working with your product or you have a monopoly. You don't get customers really liking your product if they don't love it, right? So Nadella uses words like customer love. And then you don't get that unless you have the empathy to know what problem your customers are trying to solve. So jobs to be done in, in the language you might use. Um, and I think his focus on leading indicators is, uh, you know, just really interesting from a leadership perspective. Right. So... The, the leadership issue, it, by the way, our, our framework, is, the full framework of the, of the book is create ABC and create uh, is about create your own leadership style, actually know what it is. Um, but ideally, that fits the archetype of your organization. And you have to sort of know what that DNA is. The DNA of a top down organization is different than a bottom up. And so the means of leading effectively in those organizations uh, is quite different as well. Uh, so sometimes that's a matter of choosing the right leader. Sometimes it's a matter of whoever that leader is adapting to that situation, understanding what DNA they're dealing with. Uh, and many DNAs can be effective, right? You just need to be able to lead it in the right manner. Yeah, so would... you don't want a, a leadership transplant that dramatically changes the style unless there's something fundamentally broken. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I would absolutely agree. So we've got about um, 10 minutes or so. This has just flown by. So tell me um, kind of what your passions are now. What are you, what are you up to at the moment and what's next? And uh, now that you've got the book again, great book, Innovation, Innovative Leader, uh, now that that's sort of behind you, what, what comes next? Well, I, don't, I have no idea what the next book is. <laughs> so, I didn't mean book. I just meant next project, next thing that uh, you're interested in pursuing. So we have, look, we, we have been, uh, in the world of AI for a dozen years. Um, and that has, that didn't used to like be sexy or count for anything, but uh, now it does. Uh, and so we uh, well, we have a, a working paper coming out in the coming month called Beyond the Chatbot about how companies can be more transformative in thinking about AI. Uh, but I, I think there is a tremendous opportunity to leverage AI for remaking industries. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'll tell you what we've seen in the past year has been a uh, large organization saying we need our AI strategy. And, uh, you know, I say th that is the wrong statement. That's like saying we need our data strategy, right? It, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, AI for what reason? So if you're seeking, for instance, to remake your industry, AI may provide an important avenue. It's probably not the only one. There's business model and customer experience and supplier relationships and all sorts of things. But it is one of those inflection points like we had in the late 90s where industries will be remade. Uh, so it's something that we as an organization have really leaned into. Uh, and we're increasingly seeing it even in historically very conservative organizations uh, looking at what they might do in a bolder sort of way. Uh, it does take a little bit of longer term vision, not to know exactly what's going to happen because we don't, but to say, well, this could happen or that could happen and this other thing. And that is enough to start placing those early stage chess moves that enable us to be able to uh, move in other directions quickly when the world changes. So we're not caught in 1998 going from very cautious to hyper-aggressive, uh, but we can smoothly accelerate. And that's something your firm's working on? Oh, yeah. Um, so in publications, but also in, in some of our company work, whether it's a sort of a corporate strategy about uh, where AI can not you know, just remake efficiencies, because I mean, certainly it could do that, and people are, are actually doing that pretty well. Um, but where they can be a little bit more transformative. Um, we actually have a, another ABC framework. So we, we love our ABCs. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is uh, AI, AIFI the present, become great at experimentation and create the future, mm -hmm. ABC. Uh, there's a lot of A happening now. So AI is going into the call center and it should, and that's great. Uh, there's not so much B becoming great at experimentation. There is very little C 
um, create the future. Uh, but that is where we see the puck going uh, in terms of the sort of consulting that we do about well, the name of the company, New Markets Advisors. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the predictable mistakes are that people are making? You know, if I go back to the late 90s, you, you could just see, like anybody who has any experience could just see the companies were making these dreadful, dreadful mistakes. Um, right. and, and I expect we're going to have that same set of issues come up with, with how companies are adopting AI. Right. Uh, so people have been sold a vision of the future, and so they invest a lot of money to make that vision of the future happen. Uh, even when they need to hedge their bets. Um, look, you saw Watson and IBM do this uh, in healthcare, right? I, I, AI is going to diagnose your cancer. No, it's not. Uh, maybe one day in like 20 years, but AI is certainly not starting out with diagnosing cancer in healthcare. Uh, and so avoiding just that one vision, seeing many futures and investing in the baseline moves you need to thrive in those futures, or at least to parry the disruptive threats in those futures is very important. Uh, thinking in terms of competitive strategy and not terribly insular uh, as it comes to AI, very few organizations have really done that and linked the technology through to the business strategic imperatives. For instance, if you're gonna become the number one firm in your, in your industry about customer experience, Okay, great. Now let's think about AI, but also other levers you can pull in tandem that will make that happen. Uh, the resourcing from science experiments to you see it coming to the big splashes and the overspending on, uh, on initiatives, it's incredibly inefficient. Uh, not learning from the experiments that they undertake. There can be a lot of experiments going on in an organization, but if you're not having a discipline about how you learn and cross apply that, uh, you're inviting trouble later on. So, I mean, the litany goes on and on, but you're right, they are so predictable. Yeah, yeah. And I think I, I can just continue to be astonished that we know so much about this, right? And I mean, your book is a testament to this, which is over the many years that we've really been studying innovation, there's a, the whole, body of practice and best practices and things that work and a lot of things that don't. Um, but we, for, for whatever reason, they just don't seem to be widely diffused. Um, it just seems to be a um, a mystery to so many people. And I'm, as I said, against the backdrop of this fragility of the large organization to a particular point in time, uh, you would think people would be more motivated to get this right. <laughs> you know, you would think. I'll tell you, there are two great ills in um, in innovation. So one is thinking that's all about the big idea, as we talked about. Um, in my, my keynote, I used the example of Leonardo da Vinci, that people think, oh, he was this genius. Well, okay, yeah, he was a genius, but he actually was one of the very first people to embrace the scientific method before there was a name for that thing. Uh, and that actually really helped with his genius. So it was the, the method and the systems. So, um, you know, that's a big one. Uh, and then, you know, people also get entranced by uh, once they have the vision, maybe it's not the idea, but the vision, then they overinvest in the vision. And I mean, look, Meta, which is a very competent company led by some brilliant people, did that with the metaverse. So, you know, this is not- $70 billion or something? I mean, it was like a big number. Yes, that's right. So. You don't have to be a fool to fall prey to th these ills, but it happens to everybody. And and you can educate yourself and avoid it happening too, <laughs> which I think is um, um, good. And I think one of the things that intrigues me is we, when we're trying to learn vicariously, um, there are some really critical learning disabilities that creep into the process. Um, and one of them is that the only ones left for us to learn from are the survivors. And so what we tend to do is we say, we go survey the survivors and we say, these are all the ones that did the right things. And therefore, these things that we do will make us successful as well. And a lot of times, that's just a deeply flawed assumption. They it could have been luck, they could have been in the right place at the right time. Um, or there could have been a whole bunch of other things that came before that you don't, don't see because you're only seeing the end result. And uh, one very robust finding, for example, go back to the Fire Phone, right? 
very successful corporate ventures often follow on something that didn't work out. Um, and, and so I think being open to having that rhythm is very important. Well, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. Uh, remember, get the book. Uh, full of great tips, very practical, just chock-a-block with checklists and surveys and things that you can take. Um, and if you want, you know, even improve your innovation capability by 5%, you know, <laughs> get halfway through the book. And I, I'm pretty sure you could almost do that. So Steve, thank you so much and have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.